Today we're going to be discussing Chapter 29, High Risk Newborn, Complications Associated with Gestational Age and Development. Care of the High Risk Newborns. It's important to understand that caring for high risk newborns is really a multidisciplinary approach, along with nursing, physicians, nurse midwives, the NICU team. We're also working with neonatologists, oftentimes social workers, and often even VNA or visiting nursing um, services at home to take care of these babies. Case management and clinical pathways is always an important aspect to remember uh, when caring for patients um, who are at risk for high-risk newborns in the preterm period, as well as term newborns. Really incorporating a multidisciplinary approach is going to equal to better outcomes for both baby and the family. Late preterm infants. These are infants born between 37 and 36 and 6 days, weeks of gestation. Unknown in most cases as to why these infants are born preterm, while in others um, the indication might be clear. For example, a spontaneous rupture of membranes at 34 weeks would be a, a clear indicator that baby will be born preterm. However, it might be unknown as to why that patient ruptured their membranes. So the incidence is really um, kind of a case-by-case -case basis. Some characteristics of late preterm infants include um, some issues in respiratory distress, as well as some issues um, in feeding. Um, these infants might have um, different behaviors than a term infant might be. They might um, be a little bit more challenging to kind of get onto um, the breast. If these parents are breastfeeding, um, they might tend to kind of change their vital signs a little quicker than uh, a term infant would be, in particular the temperature factor. Late preterm infants, um, some care and common problems. Again, thermoregulation. These babies are more likely to drop their temperatures and have lower temperatures or temperature instability, especially in the first 24 to 48 hours. Feedings. Because these babies are born preterm, they might have more of a disorganized latch, suck, and swallow, and that could even be exhibited during uh, bottle feeding. It's important that the moment we start caring for these patients and these babies that we also start anticipating what needs they might have for discharge, such as any adaptive equipment um, for transportation, like a car bed or any adaptive uh, equipment they might need or require at home. Preterm infants are born before the beginning of the 38th week of gestation. Some causes to preterm birth could be a source of infection for the mom, a maternal indication there, um, or it could be perhaps something about the intrauterine environment that is non-hospitable anymore, causing a uh, induction of labor or causing a recommendation for a preterm delivery. Ways we can prevent preterm birth is by recommending uh, frequent antenatal care. Patients who um, have been demonstrated to participate in antenatal care during their pregnancy um, tend to have better outcomes than patients who um, do not have prenatal care. Characteristics of preterm infants, and that kind of ranges as to how far preterm these infants are. From very early gestation, about 26, 25 weeks, these infants can have fused eyelids to a, a late-term preterm um, baby may be born at 35 or 36 weeks that has a normal newborn appearance, but perhaps some characteristics such as disorganized feedings. Um, so it really depends on what gestational age these babies are when we talk about the characteristics of preterm infants. Other assessments are important to consider are respirations. Oftentimes that is one of the number one issues in preterm birth is having respiratory issues, any kind of respiratory distress. Depending again on the gestational age that these newborns are born into um, can kind of dictate how their, their respiratory effort or their respiratory distress might be. Some nursing interventions that are very important for that bedside nurse to have are, are definitely great assessment skills. How is your newborn breathing? Are they breathing on their own spontaneously? How is their work of breathing? Does it look like these newborns are have a significant amount of retractions or grunting or nasal flaring? How, um, how is it working with equipment that could be adaptive for these newborns, such as suctioning or uh, a, a mask, a CPAP mask? Um, how is their hydration? Is that going to impact their work of breathing as well? In the next slide, slide 7 of 26, we can see a newborn in kind of a, an oxygen chamber there and positioned on um, 
on their abdomen to hopefully help with a little bit of that work of breathing that this preterm newborn can exhibit here. Other common problems continued include problems with thermoregulation. We can see oftentimes newborns admitted into newborn nurseries or the NICU um, often have these little temperature probes on them and are maybe in a climate controlled area such as an incubator. Again, these patients um, have a lot of calories that they burn when they try to thermoregulate themselves. So we try to decrease the amount of stress as much as possible by trying to control that environment uh, within normal limits there. So those little temperature probes are there to make sure that we're maintaining a warm newborn environment, decreasing their work there of um, thermoregulating themselves. Um, so we want to wean them nice and slow to an open crib um, and slowly usually that happens. It's kind of a weaning process as to how we start to drop the temperatures and allow that newborn to thermoregulate. And typically this isn't done till um, technically about a couple of days. It really depends on the newborn again and where, uh, where their gestation um, at birth lies. Other problems include problems with fluid and electrolyte balance. And again, that could be a nutrition issue. Perhaps this baby is not able to kind of take in the fluid that they need to or the nutrition that they need to, and they can start to exhibit a little bit fluid um, shift there. Maybe they're a little dehydrated. Um, so these would be patients that we could um, likely start an IV on, maybe um, start to kind of IV hydrate them or replace any kind of electrolyte imbalance that they might have. So it'd be important to have access um, to these babies' intravascular system. And we see on slide 9 an example of those temperature probes on this newborn here to thermoregulate them. Other issues, we want to consider problems with the skin. Babies born before term will have differences in their skin changes. For example, babies born very early preterm, or what is called a micropremie, about 26 to 20... Um, excuse me, 24, 26 weeks, those babies might have a very kind of thin and almost like a paper thin skin, might be very translucent. Um, and that's because of the gestation that they were born in. Their body still needed time to kind of develop that, that skin, especially for life uh, outside the uterus. So they might have issues with skin. It'd be important to consider any type of um, additional medical equipment that goes on these babies, such as those temperature probes and IV catheters. Um, we might want to use specialized equipment for these newborns to protect their, uh, the integrity of their skin. These newborns are also uh, apt to more risk or a higher risk of infection. So again, really good hand hygiene. We want to be really cognizant about the environment that these newborns are in. These newborns also might exhibit problems with pain. They might be withdrawing from pain medication or they might um, have significant changes in their vital signs or even very small amounts of changes in their vital signs that can really signify um, pain or discomfort with these newborns. They might not be um, exhibiting those same crying that other newborns might or term newborns might, maybe because of advanced medical equipment such as an intubation tube. So we'd really be looking for other signs and symptoms that might indicate pain such as a slight increase in their heart rate, slight increase in their respirations. Application of the nursing process for the preterm infant. We want to make sure that we're trying to minimize any kind of environmental stressors, uh, such as, for example, temperature. We want to assess our safety in our newborn area. We also want to monitor any nursing diagnoses that might be applicable to these patients, such as risk for infection, uh, educating parents on good hand hygiene and, um, you know, minimizing visitors would really be best advocacy for our, our small patients here. We want to discuss expected outcomes, such as um, if we have an increased risk of infection, hopefully an expected outcome would be to have no risk of infection or have no infection present. Uh, we want to talk about other interventions, such as that thermoregulation, um, or ways that we can help minimize uh, pain and discomfort without the use of medication, such as kangaroo care or skin-to-skin -skin care and educating our families on the importance of those interventions. And then at the end, we want to evaluate those interventions. Were they successful? Were they unsuccessful? And how did they impact patient care? Nutrition. Nutrition is a highly important area to be concentrated for the preterm infant. Not only are they able to suck, swallow, latch, and have weight gain or fluid intake based on that, we want to make sure that um, we have nutrition to fit their needs. Some um, 
preterm newborns might require a special type of formula if they're formula feeding, um, or maybe supplementation in addition to mom's breast milk. Preterm uh, newborns can cause a little bit of um, kind of a tight situation for moms who, let's say, haven't started their milk production quite yet. So these newborns might um, be needed um, to, or might be recommended to have them supplement as well. So we want to think about some nursing diagnoses that applies to this patient population, such as weight gain. We want to be assessing their I's and O's, and we do that by measuring um, perhaps like the weight of their diapers or the amount of stools they have per day, um, really kind of assessing that they're taking in fluid and that it is contributing uh, to their nutrition. We want to educate parents on uh, newborn feedings. If we have a mom who's breastfeeding, it might be a great nursing intervention to kind of use that multidisciplinary approach and set them up with a lactation consultant to kind of fit those preterm newborn needs. Uh, we might also require some additional uh, medical equipment to feed these newborns, such as an NG tube, and we can teach parents how to care for a newborn who's going home with an NG tube, what it's like to feed those babies, care for those babies. Um, any type of oral feedings, we want to make sure that we're educating our caregivers on being comfortable with these things. And we want to, of course, facilitate, promote um, newborn and patient bonding there. In our slide 13 of 26, we can see a, a caregiver there feeding, uh, a bottle feeding a newborn here. Preterm inference. We talked a little bit about parenting. We really want to watch that attachment and bonding with parents going home with a preterm newborn or parents who have a preterm newborn in the hospital, in the special care unit or in the NICU unit. We want to promote that attachment and bonding, especially because we know it's going to be very different from parents who are able to deliver their term newborn and go home with them within the next couple of days. We want to facilitate newborn parent bonding, allow those parents to kind of feel like they are the ones caring for their newborn, maybe by having them dress the newborn, feel comfortable feeding, so on and so forth. Uh, we really want to promote that, that parent new baby bonding there. And um, perhaps planning is really an integral part of, of making sure that parents feel like they are part of the caregiving experience, such as um, waiting maybe until um, a great time for parents to do some teaching. So maybe not at the end of the night or the end of the shift where they might be really tired and sleepy and ready to go home, but maybe planning for that breastfeeding feeding uh, to happen in the beginning of their visit or earlier during the day. Parenting interventions, advanced preparation. So these are things we want to think about, um, especially for their hopeful discharge home. Um, what kind of equipment will they need? Um, do we need uh, follow-ups in the home? Are these patients who will be um, needing visiting nurses' services in the home? Um, support. How are these parents feeling bringing home a preterm newborn? Um, do they feel like they have all the support they need? Are they um, patients who you might want to set up with social work? Are they feeling overwhelmed? We want to provide them with the most up-to-date information that's really going to help impact um, their patient care and help provide good outcomes for their newborns. Uh, we want to promote that kangaroo care, that skin-to-skin -skin care. Um, and through interactions from the caregivers and the nursing staff, we want to assess how those, um, excuse me, how those interventions are working. Um, after perhaps some feeding education with the parents, do does it look like the parents can be comfortable with that? Ask them, you know, confront them. Is this an okay thing? Are you feeling okay? Are you feeling confident going home with your newborn? Uh, you want to kind of increase their decision making, really promote that parent bonding again. Um, to review or alleviate any concerns and talk about ongoing things, especially as we're getting ready towards discharge. Respiratory distress syndrome is a syndrome experienced by preterm newborns, which causes insufficient production of surfactant in the lungs. And surfactant is produced by uh, the newborn towards the end of the pregnancy, especially towards that third trimester. So babies born in the second or early part of their third trimester have really not produced adequate amounts of surfactant in their lungs, which can help mature um, the lungs. And without that surfactant there, these newborns can experience some distress syndrome. So they're not able to kind of expand their lungs completely. They're not able to kind of intake the O2 required um, for them. Manifestations could be a discoloration in the newborns. They might be a little dusky. They might... Um, 
kind of the less active. These are uh, newborns that would be dropping their O2 saturations. They might have an increase in their work of breathing, such as nasal flaring, retractions, and grunting. So some therapeutic management for these newborns might be the administration of surfactant by mouth. It might be um, perhaps some support from some oxygen, such as an ET tube, an intubation tube, um, or a CPAP mask. So some considerations for that would be, again, that parent bonding there, especially for a newborn that is perhaps intubated or on a continuous pressure mask like a CPAP. Uh, might be a little bit more challenging to get these patients to do that skin-to-skin -skin care or kind of bond with their baby in a way that they had imagined. So really kind of prioritizing that newborn safety and making sure that we're meeting their needs, especially in terms of oxygen. We can find other creative ways to kind of have those patients bond with their newborn. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia is a chronic condition which causes damage to the infant's lungs requiring prolonged dependence on supplemental oxygen. So these are newborns that we anticipate going home with additional um, oxygen. These are patients who can go home on a nasal cannula, sometimes a little bit more advanced um, airways. Um, manifestations similar to that of the respiratory distress syndrome. These are patients who are dropping their O2 saturations, patients who are exhibiting that nasal flaring, the grunting. They might even have a little bit of kind of a cough as a way to um, kind of compensate for that loss of O2. So some therapeutic management for these patients. Again, these patients will be going home with specialized equipment, um, extra oxygen extra oxygen tubes, perhaps nasal cannulas. These are patients who should be having um, VNA services or visiting nursing services um, in the home to kind of help and assess um, with that newborn. Intraventricular hemorrhage, which is bleeding into and around the ventricles of the, of the brain. Um, some pathophysiology related to this really depends on um, kind of the circumstances surrounding delivery. For example, if this is a 24, 25 weaker, this could be something that occurs just as the extreme prematurity occurred. So they have a little bit of that bleeding that can come around the ventricles of the brain. This could also occur um, to a newborn who perhaps had um, an assisted delivery, such as a vacuum or forceps, which caused some of that intraventricular hemorrhage as well. So some manifestations would be changes in the vital signs that we would see. Um, depending on the area or the volume of bleeding around the ventricles of the brain, we could always also almost see kind of an outpouching um, of extended kind of cerebral tissue there. We can see um, changes in the soft spots of those babies' heads. So perhaps the suture lines that we were assessing before in a newborn assessment are not lining up again and they're perhaps really full or distended. So those would be manifestations um, of this issue as well. Therapeutic management could be a shunt placement in the newborn. Um, in their brain could be a small um, surgery that's performed to kind of help relieve some of that um, fluid that's there as well. So considerations would be assessing the vital signs, again making sure that we're keeping the health and, health and safety of this baby um, intact in communication with our providers as well. Retinopathy of prematurity, which is an injury to the blood vessels around the eye in the newborn, may result in visual impairment and in extreme cases, blindness in the preterm infant. And the exact cause of this issue is unknown, but it is thought to have a correlation between high levels of oxygen as a very high risk factor. For example, extreme preterm newborns who um, are given high amounts of oxygen, um, perhaps even pressurized, can be at risk for um, kind of blowing those blood vessels of very small capillaries in the eye itself. Um, some therapeutic management for these newborns is kind of um, really measured oxygen and the amount that these newborns need. Um, so finding that fine balance between what the newborn requires for O2 supplementation and uh, making sure that we're not causing harm to these newborns. Necrotizing enterocolitis is a serious inflammatory condition of the intestinal tract may lead to cellular death of areas of intestinal mucosa. This is a very, very, very important concept to most NICU nurses know near and dear, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. Again, cause of an infection that causes cellular death of areas of the intestinal mucosa, meaning that these babies can lose part of part or all of their gut. Um, manifestations would be changes in the vital signs. We would see perhaps a decrease in temperature for these babies as a sign of infection for them. Um, issues feeding. We can see um, 
babies who have extreme distension in their abdomen as well. Therapeutic management could include the use of some antibiotics as well as uh, the reduction of some of the GI tract as well. So these patients might lose um, part of their bowels. A short bowel syndrome is a bowel that is shorter than normal. It's, it's caused by a congenital malformation or a surgical resection. It's pathophysiology, again, shortening that bowel so these patients have um, issues with absorption and nutrition if we're shortening that bowel there. Short bowel or um, the large intestine really kind of depends where that um, short bowel is exhibited. So manifestations, again, because we know this is a nutrition issue, is um, changes in perhaps weights, amounts of wet and dirty diapers for these newborns that we're seeing, um, perhaps issues with their intake and nutrition as well. Therapeutic management could be um, the advancement of perhaps a GI tube or um, that multidisciplinary approach meeting with uh, nutritionists and um, clinicians there so that we can really kind of manage the nutrition of this newborn. Post-term infants are infants born after the 42nd week of gestation, and um, these infants also carry, carry their own inherent risks. They've been kind of in the um, uterus for a little longer than they should be, so they um, might have some breakdown in their skin integrity, might be dry, might be peely, um, they might have uh, meconium passed in the fluid as well, and we uh, know that that has a risk of aspiration as well, so we want to manage these um, newborns as well. Small for gestational age infants, so some causes could be um, some issues with hypertension in the pregnancy for moms. If there is an issue with uh, circulation and there's an issue with blood flow to the placenta, we know that blood flow to the placenta can cause problems with the growth and development of that baby because that's where they're getting all their oxygen and blood flow and nutrition from. Um, so we really want to have good um, prenatal care for our patients here and promote that prenatal care. Uh, scope of the problem really depends on the growth um, or how small for gestational age these newborns are. Um, we measure it in percentiles. So these patients might be a little bit off the growth curve, so they might also experience things like changes in thermal regulation for their babies, difficulties with that, perhaps difficulty with feeding and nutrition for these newborns. You really want to manage it um, based on the characteristics the newborn is exhibiting. Um, therapeutic management might mean that we monitor these babies a little bit more closely for changes in thermal regulation or changes in um, perhaps their blood glucose. Babies that are a little smaller for gestational age and babies that are a little bit larger for gestational age oftentimes have a difficulty managing their own uh, blood glucose, um, especially in the hours and days after birth uh, once they have to kind of manage that on their own. So we really want to be monitoring these babies for those big changes there. Large for gestational age newborns, like I had talked about before, these are newborns we might want to have on our blood sugar protocol, be monitoring their ability to maintain their blood glucose levels within normal limits once they have to work independently to do so. Um, things that we would look for, any considerations with that would be signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, that jitteriness, um, perhaps that disorganized feeding. Um, we want to assess their vital signs as well. So really kind of uh, watching and assessing these newborns is very important. And then our last slide here, what is the most important reason to protect the preterm infant from cold stress? 